Welcome to our online videos that follow along in OpenStax Astronomy. We're going to have a video that does a quick overview of just the first couple of sections of Chapter 1. The other sections are really useful to read through, um, but they provide a kind of narrative introduction that we won't reproduce here in this video. What I want to start out by saying is that astronomy is a field of science. And one key thing about science that a lot of people don't necessarily uh, have in mind when they first start taking a science class is that the goal of science is not just to memorize a bunch of facts and figures that could be looked up. Instead, it's figuring out how to look at the world and make observations and understand what's causing all of those different observations. It's a method to gain new knowledge. And one of the key things about astronomy is that unlike most of the other sciences, we don't have a lot of things that we can do hands-on in a lab that will allow us to explore the topics that we're going to be talking about this semester. We rely on distant object observations, either ground-based telescopes or spacecraft, to be able to study the things that are part of astronomy. As we gather observations or experiments in any science, one of the key parts of this method is that we create models or ideas about how the world works. And to be a scientific idea, we have to have those comments, those ways of thinking about the world be testable. And then we can call that a hypothesis, that we come up with something that we can test against new observations. Now, one of the things I want us to consider is the idea of what we mean by testing a hypothesis. So we've got a question for us. This is the first one we've seen, because uh, it's only like the um, third slide of this video. And um, we're going to see this a lot. It's called pause and think multiple choice questions. Often when I do these in class, um, these are think pair share questions and you talk with the people around you. But if you're watching this video, then you have to kind of think through it and talk through it with yourself. But what it means by pause and think is I do actually want you to pause the video, come up with an answer and an explanation for it, and then unpause when you're ready to hear my answer and explanation. Okay, so the first question we have, how many observational or experimental tests does it take to prove a hypothesis false? So think through that question, pause the video for as long as you need to. Okay, now the key thing here is that if we come up with a statement that is our hypothesis, we can use an example to make sure we understand why um, the answer is the way it is in this situation. So let's say, and this is an example from the textbook, let's say that we are on an island and our um, island has a whole bunch of sheep and all of these sheep on this particular island have black wool. Our hypothesis might be that all sheep have black wool. Perfectly valid hypothesis and we look at the sheep around us and it seems to fit. But what is the only thing that needs to happen for that statement to be proven false? We only need to be shown one single sheep with white wool. And then we have to rethink our idea. We might only have to adjust our hypothesis slightly, but we still can find that one specific test that disproves the hypothesis. It is fairly straightforward to prove things false in science. Okay, so a new question for us. Again, the same kind of format. I want you to think through and pause while you consider. But how many observational or experimental tests does it take to prove a hypothesis true? So pause the video as long as you need to. All right. Now this one's tougher. This one is getting at the heart of what we mean to prove something true. It has to be 100% absolute truth. And the really key thing about science is science doesn't deal in absolute truths. So let's say that we go around the globe and we study and survey all these different sheep and we come up with the statement that most sheep have white wool. That seems pretty valid and it's supported by a whole lot of evidence. However, to prove it 100% true, we would have to find every sheep in the entire universe. It would take an infinite number of experimental tests to prove this hypothesis fully true. 
So in science, there's a big difference and a really important difference between trying to prove something 100% absolutely true, which we cannot do, and proving things true beyond a reasonable doubt, which is not what um, we mean when we say proving something. And so the key thing is that nothing in science can be proven 100% true, but we have ways to talk about ideas that have been supported by such a wide range of evidence that they're boosted beyond the level of just hypothesis. And then we call that a scientific theory. We may use the word theory in everyday language in a different way, but it is important for us to understand that the word theory in a science context means an idea that has been proven true beyond a reasonable doubt. We can never be 100% certain, but it fits every single piece of evidence because remember, it only takes that one test to prove something false. So if it's a theory, it has not been proven false. That's true for the theory of gravity, the theory of climate change, the theory of evolution. And so we need to understand that context um, in science. Scientists are always trying to disprove each other, and so their ideas are constantly being subjected to new tests trying to throw out the bad ideas and keep hold of the good ideas. And so that process of everyone is trying to disprove everyone else means that the stuff that sticks around, these statements that stick around and can eventually become theories, they have been, um, they have been really rig rigorously tested. And so that word has a lot of weight to it that we really don't use in everyday language as much as we should. Okay, one of the other key things that we need to think about as we're starting this semester is that because we are studying these di distant objects in astronomy, there's a lot of things that we have to kind of take with a grain of salt that the stuff we know about that happens in our solar system is also happening in other solar systems. And the physics that we can test here on Earth, dropping objects, rolling things down hills, that kind of fundamental physics, is also happening on the other side of the known universe. And so one of the fundamental principles that we have to accept as a truth, and again, remember I just said that uh, science doesn't deal in absolute truths, we call it a principle and it what well, the idea is, is we have to say, if this is true, then we can build our entire science field. But we have to take that one step of, we have to trust that the universe is behaving by the same scientific laws everywhere. If that's ever proven false, then we'll have to start from scratch uh, pretty much in astronomy. So that's something that's kind of interesting and always worth keeping in the back of your head. We will be talking in um, chapter 2, about some of the fundamental principles that the ancient Greeks based their entire understanding um, of the universe on, and how those got proven false, and then we had to start over. Now, there are a lot of these fundamental laws in astronomy that really are best summarized by a mathematical equation. Anytime that we see those mathematical equations in this class, we will talk through them in words, we will understand the underlying concepts, but we will be seeing those equations because they are the most concise and complete way to talk about some of these universal concepts, these universal laws. Now, there will be a small amount of math that we see in the textbook that we try in, um, in activities this semester. And it's worth making sure we understand something important about numbers in general and then talk about numbers in astronomy specifically. Now, in general, in any science class, whenever we're talking about a measurement of some kind, we always need a number and a unit. That unit is the thing that gives that number context. So a couple of examples. My cat, Penelope, is five and a half years old. Five and a half is the number, and years is the unit that tells us what that number actually means. She weighs 12 pounds, 12 is the number, and pounds is the uh, context that tells us what that 12, what that number means. And yesterday, she, she chased two bugs. Two is the number, and bugs, while it is not a standard scientific unit, is still the thing that is giving that number context. Now, without units, sometimes things still make sense. If I talk to you about my cat Penelope and I say that she's five and a half, 
That is actually how we talk about ages in everyday um, language, right? My niece is 12. I don't have to say 12 years old for you to know what I'm talking about. But it is worth recognizing that that first statement, my cat Penelope is five and a half, that still has some ambiguity. If you knew that I had some full-grown cats at home and some kittens at home, that could be years or it could be months, and we wouldn't know if I didn't say the unit specifically. The second one, she weighs uh, 12. That doesn't sound normal. That's not how we talk about um, weights in everyday language, weights or mass. And we can probably guess at the unit. 12 pounds makes sense if we know that we're talking about a cat. We certainly don't hope that she weighs 12 kilograms. That would be an enormous cat I'm pointing over there. She's on the couch. Um, and so the unit missing, we can still guess what it is, but it doesn't sound right. And then this last example, yesterday she chased two. Now for any of you who have cats or dogs at home, you know that that could honestly be anything. She could chase two spring toys, she could chase two socks while we're trying to do laundry, she could chase two squirrels looking at them through the window. Without the unit there, that number two has no meaning whatsoever. We don't know what we're talking about anymore when we don't have that unit. So another, uh, another thought um, experiment for us to help us think about this importance of units. This is another problem type that we will see throughout the semester. These are pause and think open questions. So rather than there being multiple choice, I still want you to think through the question, pause the video so that you can think as long as you need to, maybe write out an answer for some of these, not necessarily this one. And then we come back and we talk about it. Okay, so let's take a moment and picture in our head a cube, or draw it on our page. This cube has sides that are eight, and then we forgot the unit, eight something long. Now I want you to imagine a familiar object near your cube. Maybe draw it on your page, on top of, next to, anywhere. And I want you to think about what object you kind of subconsciously put next to your cube to give it a specific size. So consider that briefly. Okay. So in my head, I was thinking of a um, small cube, maybe like a, um, a dice, that, dice that you might roll uh, in, a game of, um, in a game of chance. And so maybe I put a, a pencil eraser next to it to give it some context. And so maybe that was five or sorry, eight millimeters as my unit that I kind of implicitly chose even if I didn't have a specific scientific unit in mind. You may have gone anywhere from very small to very large. Uh, I had a friend of mine uh, a while back draw several different examples, and so maybe yours fits in somewhere in this range. A cat cube, and so maybe it's eight centimeters on each side, and we just kind of like set it on top of Penelope's head. Maybe a gentleman cube, and it's eight inches on each side, and it's kind of... Um, big to hold in one hand. Maybe it's a cube of great wonder and it's eight yards in all direction and we're bowing down to it. Or maybe it's a cube being hit towards the earth in a game of galactic billiards. And that unit is much larger than the ones that we use every day. Any of these would have been valid because those units were missing. So something to consider about how the importance of units plays a role. Now, if you've ever have to look up a value um, in your textbook or look it up online, that's the key thing I want us to be aware of, is we need to make sure that we're always writing down the unit and being aware of what context that gives our numbers. One of the biggest things we need to be aware of is distances, because all throughout semest the semester, we are going to see distances that are in terms of kilometers. That's kind of a on-earth general distance scale. We will see numbers that are uh, distances that are in astronomical units. That might be when we're talking about things within our own solar system, things that orbit our single sun. We might see distances in light years or parsecs. Both of those are much larger distances, uh, equivalent to the distances between stars or between uh, galaxies in millions of parsecs or megaparsecs. So we're going to see these different units, and we just want to make sure to keep track of them so that we know that those are the thing giving our numbers context. Now, the other key thing I do need to point out here is that we need to talk a bit about scientific notation. 
And I'm not going to go through in this particular lecture describing start to finish what scientific notation is and what it looks like, because everyone comes in with a different level of um, confidence and comfort with this. And so there's a link here um, to a, um, a website where you can practice with scientific notation, you can go through the different rules, and quiz yourself on how it works. The one thing I will say in this particular introduction video is that scientific notation is kind of like a way for us to save time when we're writing out numbers in the same way that we use words like billion or trillion to save time when we are talking about numbers. So on the slide I have a number written out in kind of standard notation, how we might say that number, one trillion, and what it looks like in scientific notation. Much easier to write down as long as we understand what scientific notation is. The reason why it's so important to us is because in astronomy, we talk about numbers that are vast in terms of distances and vast in terms of size, in terms of um, time. So we will be seeing scientific notation all over the place, and we need to make sure we know what those numbers mean when we see it. So again, we can practice as much as we need to to get caught up outside of this particular lecture video. That's why I'm not going through all of the rules. But there's a link here that's a resource for um, practicing with scientific notation. And then this video link is going through the different orders of magnitude so that we get a better sense of all of these dis different distance scales that are part of what we consider to be astronomy. The last thing I want to note in this particular video is that my main goal in all of these um, videos and all of the specific topics that we focus on out of the OpenStax astronomy textbook is to build critical thinking skills. It is not essential to me that we memorize the most minute details or dates or uh, terms that only show up once and never again. What I want us to understand is some of these big picture concepts, how they fit together, and how we can start to build this understanding of the method of science to allow us to build new knowledge. This astronomy course is a way to develop critical thinking skills while learning about some really amazing ideas. And so I like this quote from Albert Einstein, and I'll finish with our um, first lecture video here. Education is not the learning of facts, but the training of the mind to think. So that's my goal for us this whole semester, and I'm excited for it. I hope you are too.